Welcome to Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. Whether you're 25 or 45, there's bound to be a discussion that you care about. Our mission is to share practical ways to find God in your everyday life. And now today's host, Chris Lang. If there was a Nobel Prize offered for complaining, I'm pretty sure Americans would have won it several times. 20 years ago, we created the complaint hotline industry. And more recently, we've become so sophisticated in our multitasking culture that we've created these one-word zingers like, whatever. And now we can even complain to the whole world on sites like platewire.com, where after you get cut off on the highway by somebody, you simply add their license plate uh, number along with nasty comments about how dangerous that person is to society. Hello, I'm Chris Lang, and today's topic is Complaint Fasting for Life. We'll talk about how we can find contentment and actually contagious joy by making intentional choices with God's help. My guest today is Danny Hernandez, collegiate and young adult pastor at the Forest Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. His church service is called Deeper, with hundreds of young adults each Sabbath and streamed live worldwide via the Internet. Our Hope on Fire producer, Randy McGray, and director, Delwyn Finch, are huge supporters. Thanks, guys, for all you do for the ministry. Danny, it's great to have you here. You know, this this series you've been preaching on joy, on the book of Philippians, the joy series. Um, You started sharing with me this eight-part series, and I want to encourage, by the way, Uh, all of you listening to this program today to go check out the sermon series that God put on Danny's heart on Philippians at deeperfaith.org. Find them all there and get caught up so that you're not left out in this uh, discussion here. Just kind of bring you along. Yeah, and we're just we're just touching on one of the sermons. Yeah, this was uh, week one, two, three. uh, I think this is week four. uh, So we're right in the middle of it. Yeah. In the heart of it, as it were. Right, right. So uh, Danny, when you got to this subject, something happened in your heart and God started convicting you about this and and you kind of were challenged weren't you yeah um as we were working through the book of Philippians I got to to chapter 2 verse 14 um and it became the focus of my message that day and and as I read it I said do all things without grumbling I'm like oh what does that mean grumbling and as I looked it up in the Septuagint and in the Greek uh, in the Old Testament it is the same word that was used to describe the Israelites after they left Egypt and they were in the desert just constantly just complaining about everything you know not having AC and all that stuff <laughs> uh, so so yeah. as I prepared I thought you know what I- I'm gonna challenge deeper the church to go on this complaint fast uh, yeah. I'm going to challenge them to go for an entire week without complaining. Um, it, so, so after thinking that, I decided, well, you know what? I said, I, I'm going to start. It was Wednesday. I'd finished my message on Wednesday. Uh, and I thought, I'm going to get a head start on this. And I'm going to start a complaint fast from now until the next Saturday, which would have been about 10 days or so. So, uh, so I did. And, and the crazy thing is that as soon as I decided, I said, God, I'm going to live complaint free for the next 10 days, everything just kind of started to happen. And things went a little crazy. All right. So let me get this straight. Uh, you gave God, you gave God some space and he brought a whirlwind. Um, as it were. As it were. A yeah. 24 we, hour whirlwind. Yeah. I'm not going to say who the whirlwind came from. Oh, okay. You know, I'm just going to say that things became a little challenging. That, like I said, it was Wednesday and Thursday. I decided I was going to take the day off. I was going to go to, uh, to, uh, to Mosquito Lagoon. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's about, you know, an hour and a half from Orlando. Um, and I was going to load up my kayak and do a little bit of fly fishing, uh, while I was there. Um, I'm not a very, I don't, my cars, I've spent a total of $400 in my last five cars. So my, all my cars are, you know, just a little challenged. And I always live on the edge when, when I drive my vehicles because, you know, they're always a little iffy. Um, so, so I get in the truck, uh, this was Thursday morning, and I start driving. Mm-hmm. And about 15, 20 minutes into it, my car starts going crazy. My gauges start going up and down. Everything starts blinking. It's like Christmas inside my car. Wow. Just lights everywhere. So, you know, being the person that I'm like, ah, oh, it, 
I'll be fine. I'll just keep on driving. So I, I keep driving. I get to Mosquito Lagoon. Out in the middle of nowhere. I'm a mile from the nearest road. I have no cell signal. I, I park the truck. I take my kayak out. I take all my fly fishing stuff yeah. out. I get ready to just you know pull off and go. And I realize that left something in the truck. Doing a little wild adventure. A little wild adventure, sure. actually. Yeah. yeah. So I, I go back to the truck to get in. Realize I have locked my keys inside the truck. They're sitting right there. I can see them. Okay, they're there. I was like, well, I couldn't get them. <laughs> so, so the keys are there. I'm I'm in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, well, let me call my wife and let her know that I you might, might be a little late. You might be a little late. Yeah, coming home. Yeah, yeah. So I get my cell phone, but no cell signal. So I start walking towards the main road, just kind of doing this thing, looking for a bar. You know, I don't have that company with all the bars everywhere. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I was searching for a bar desperately. Um, finally, I got one little bar, dialed my wife. She picks up the phone, said, hey, honey, listen, I might be a little late because I got my keys locked in the truck. I don't know how I'm going to get in. She tells me, well, honey, I'm tied up right now. Can I talk to you later? Bye. Wow. That's the kind of love I got from my wife. I love her. Yeah. Anyways, I start walking back to the truck. I don't know what I'm going to do. Okay, I start looking for things. I go back to the truck. I try to get in. I can't get in. I have no way of getting in. And finally, I realize I'm going to have to break a window to get in my truck. All this time, at the forefront of every thought is, you're not complaining. Okay. Okay. You're remembering I, this. I'm remembering this. This is, this is like ingrained in my head because the previous day I said, I'm not going to complain. So the whole time there with my truck acting funny, you know, this whole thing, I'm like, you know what? I'm not complaining. I said, I'm just going to take it as it is and just roll with it. So I get there. I, I try to figure out how to get in the truck. I can't. I start looking for things. And finally, I realize, you know what? This is a great game. You nice. know, this is a great, I'm going to make a game out of this, you know. All right. I'm thinking I'm at some reality TV show. You know, I'm like, okay, you're locked in the middle of nowhere with a car and the keys inside. How do you get in? You only have a kayak, a fishing pole, and some hooks. Sounds it, like an old TV series called MacGyver. Very much so. Way back when, here you are looking for something that can solve I'm the looking mystery. For the mystery. Yes. So, I end up finding uh, a piece of plastic. I don't know what it belongs to. Probably another truck that drove by really fast and lost something. Um, and, and I start looking at this thing. I'm like, wow, what, what, how can I use this? So I start shoving this thing in every little possible hole that I can on the <laughs> side of the door. But it's not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Finally, I thought, okay, what else do I have? What do I have with me? And I looked. I took inventory of my things. Yeah. And I found some fishing hooks. Nice. Okay. All right. So I thought, what can I do with a piece of plastic and a fishing hook? I'm like, this is great. Now I'm being creative, okay? I, I like being right creative. Right brain starts uh, it's, firing. It's, just, it's firing. It's firing yeah, right yeah. now. Yeah. I, I'm feeling so, it. So I, I end up, you, you probably can't see this. And, and anyways, uh, maybe maybe you can get a shot of that. That looks dangerous, Danny. It's a hook. Wow. And, and what I ended up doing is with this piece of plastic, I, I put a little hole up here and a little hole down here. And I was able to manage to shove this hook through there, which was pretty tight. I was able to get this thing and slide it through the door and get the little point of the hook on the lock and boop, pulled it out. Now, I know I told the story. This took me two hours to figure out, okay? <laughs> it took me two hours, but those were two complaint-free hours. Now, for those of you watching uh, or, or listening on radio, you, you gotta come to our website, hopeonfire.org, and, and take a look at this. I would advise you parents, don't let your children do this <laughs> at home. Don't try this at home, okay? Uh, this, this looks it's pretty scary. Yeah. Uh, Randy, what is, what is your nickname for Danny? Colossal Cuban. I have to say, Danny, you're a lot bigger in my in my view. You're a lot bigger in my uh, perception. That's if, amazing. If you ever need to get in your car, give me a call. I'll have this available. <clears throat> you're going to okay. be framing that, or just I'm keeping it, it handy in case you maybe get I'll just out. sell it online. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? But but so, that wasn't the end of the 24-hour whirlwind. No, no, no. That wasn't the end. That was just the beginning. That was the fun part, actually. You know, that was the fun part. I ended up going kayaking for a few minutes and came back and drove home and finished doing a few things that I needed to do. Finally Finally that evening, Thursday night, we went to bed, my wife and I. Kids are in bed, the dog is sleeping. You know, it's three o'clock in the morning and, and I wake up because the dog is acting a little funny. It's kind of freaky. He's kind of freaky. He's just making noises yeah. like he was running around in yeah. the uh, in the bedroom. Yeah. And uh, so I told Lori, I says, what's, what's wrong with our dog? And she says, I don't know, he's just, you know, 
like dreaming or something. <laughs> it, you know, so, you know, dogs, I guess, dream that they just, I don't know. Uh, so, <laughs> so we it get happens. up. Yeah, it happens. We get up and we look and the dog is having a seizure. Now, it's it's a 14-month-old puppy. He's a labradoodle. He's big. He's about 60 pounds. So even though he's 14 months, he's still, you know. So it's kind of a big puppy. He's a very large puppy. Okay. <laughs> Furry, the cutest little thing you've ever seen. And so he's he's there by the door, yeah. and he's having a seizure. And the reason we hear this noise is because his head is kind of hitting the door yeah. as he's you know having the seizure. Right. Well, the first thing that we do is obviously like parents, you want to go and comfort the dog mm -hmm. and all these things. So my right. wife goes and lays down next to the dog and starts rubbing his belly while he's having the seizure. Um, and then he came out of the seizure, and when he came out of the seizure, he became like a crazy dog. And the moment he snapped out of it, he snapped at Lori and bit her thumb. My. Yeah. No, I, I, I thought that he just kind of nicked it and yeah. she kind of grabbed her thumb. Yeah. And, and it happened so fast. It, it was just a split second. It was just like a tap, just like that. And, and she screamed and went to the bathroom. And so the dog is now looking at me like, you're next, buddy. You want a piece of me? <laughs> Did he have like a New York accent from Brooklyn or something? <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, right. So, so, so I kind of stepped back because wow. this dog now is looking a little freaky because he's got like blood you know, on the side of his mouth. And he's like glaring at me and, uh, and barking at me like he had no clue who I was. So I run in the bathroom. My wife is stand, sitting there on the floor, actually. I grab a towel and I wrap it around my arm. You know, it's now the dog and me you know and he's like Arr. so i have this i don't know why i did that i think i've seen it on tv where people like you know the this, animal trainer the, so, yeah. something maybe the know? dog whisperer that, uh, i know i yeah. try to do that but it didn't work <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. no, didn't work for me so i get this thing wrapped around me and i managed to just sneak over to the sliding glass door that we have in our yeah. bedroom yeah, yeah. i slide it open and you know he just kind of like goes out there and i close it so right. now right crazy dog is out in the, in the porch step one step one He's barking, screaming, whatever it is a dog do. Still bloody, you know, looking at me. I'm freaked out. I've never been afraid of a dog in my life. I was afraid of my own dog, which is really, really weird. So I go back in the bathroom. You don't go to school for that, I guess. Nah, I All didn't. Right. Okay. Yeah. You missed so, that class. I missed that class. <laughs> I skipped that day. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Ah, dog training in the Old Testament. Yeah, no, it wasn't there. <laughs> so, All right. So you go in the bathroom. So I go in the bathroom. My wife is sitting there on the floor. I, I, she has this huge towel wrapped around her thumb, and she says, honey, I think he took a piece of my thumb off. She says, would you go into the bedroom and see if you can find it? I'm thinking she's kidding. I'm thinking I'm not gonna find anything. I'm like, yeah, honey, whatever. So I go back into the bedroom, and I see something on the floor, thinking it's something that belongs to my girls, a little baby doll, little you know, pet shop little thing in jig. I reached down and grabbed it, and um, what it was, it was the top of her thumb. Oh, wow. Like a little right. mushroom cap. Wow. Fingernail and all. Wow. Okay? Three o'clock in the morning, crazy dog outside, wife about to pass out full of blood in the bathroom. I'm holding a thumb in my hand, and you know what I'm thinking? Hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you'll stay with us. We'll be right back after this message. You're listening to Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. Hi, welcome back. I'm Chris Lang, your host on Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. I'm here in the studio with my colossal Cuban friend, Danny Hernandez. And, and uh, I know you're on the edge of your seat because I am too. And Danny, uh, Delwin and uh, Randy were so on the edge of their seat, they almost missed the break. So <laughs> where were we? Uh, you had a piece of uh, finger in your hand. I, I did. Uh, the, the dog um, was out on the porch. My wife was in the bathroom. She asks me to go back into the, to the bedroom to see if I could find a piece of her thumb. And, and what I picked up what I thought was one of my girl's toys. And it was actually the, the very top of her thumb nail and all and i'm sitting there holding this thing thinking to myself i'm holding a thumb which was pretty freaky i've never you know actually held a thumb before so picture this in your mind wife bleeding in the bathroom crazy dog out in the porch there's blood in the bathroom and i'm holding a thumb that whole thing is just so bizarre and surreal to me it's it's, it's, it's not it, even funny it, it almost sounds like a more than pg it, right? it, you know it's almost it, more than we can it, show here it was yeah definitely more than that so 
Um, so you had, so we have a picture we were going to share. And for those of you, again, who are listening on the radio, driving somewhere, go to our website, hopeonfire.org, and find this program uh, to see what God was doing in the middle of all of this stress. In the, in the midst of it all. And, and I couldn't get that thought in my head. Do everything without complaining. Wow. It was just stuck there. So I'm taking the stump, put him in a little Ziploc bag with some ice. I'm going back into the bathroom. My wife is there. She's like... I think I'm going to pass out. And I was like, honey, I'm going to pass out with you because it was pretty gruesome stuff. And she's like, well, that's okay. Just lay down right next to me then if you have to. Wow. So so at that point, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm having to call someone to come and meet us at the ER. I have to wake up the girls. I have to load Lori in the, in the van and, and, and do all of that, which is absolutely just crazy. Um, we, we got her to the hospital. They couldn't attach that top part of her thumb. And um, they did surgery the next morning. But the most insane thing is, through this whole thing, I don't know, I'm sure my wife wasn't in my head, and I'm sure she wasn't part of this complaint fast thing. Right. But through it all, neither one of us complained about this whole situation. As a matter of fact, we were slightly thankful <laughs> in that... That's kind of a twisted thought, in it, a way. It was... You know, From a human standpoint. Yeah, and God has a way of doing things, because I was thankful that it was three o'clock in the morning and that my girls were asleep. Wow. They weren't there. I was thankful that it was the tip of her thumb. And not the whole. And not the whole thumb or her hand. Um, uh, so many things to be thankful for. And so we both didn't complain. We, we just realized that it is what it is. And we might as well make the best of it. So in the hospital, in the ER, something that people kept saying over and over again, it's like, you guys seem to be like happy <laughs> and and i thought yeah that's kind of weird i'm not complaining and they're like yeah we've noticed wow so so you made an intentional decision and god was honoring that with some kind of um return of uh of presence uh settling on your spirit it, it was and you know at times we think we say you know god um People say, you be careful what you commit to, because then God's going to allow trials to come your way, to challenge you. But I'd rather think of it a different way. I'd rather think of it as God showing me that I can do it, not Him sending my tr trials to just to test me. You know, if, if I would have gone on this complaint fast, and nothing bad would have happened, then what? I mean, I, I wouldn't have known that I do have the strength, I, I do have the power to be able to, to be complaint-free. Right. So, so as we were going around the hospitals and, and talking to all these people, you know, it was obvious that even in the midst of our chaos, we were bringing smiles to them. So, so I go back to Philippians, and right. I'm reading Philippians, right. and I'm saying, do all things without grumbling, complaining, or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. I thought, wow, could, could all that be put together in context and say, when you don't complain, when you don't grumble, when, when you, you don't live a life that's just filled with just blah, 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 blah. Is that a word? Blah, blah, blah. I like it. Yeah, okay. It works. We're making it. Blah, blah, blah. That makes you shiny. Okay? Not complaining, being thankful makes you shiny. In other words, people will see your attitude. People will see your life. They will see the way that you react to circumstances, the attitude you take towards circumstances. And that in itself is a testimony of who God is. And what we're looking for, Christ is asking us to shine as lights in the world. A light that's not hidden under a bushel? Absolutely not. And is it not, the? in fact, Paul himself, the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter said, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of self-control. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is, it, is, it, is this not a matter of um, respect on God's part? Because if you had not made that choice, uh, God might not necessarily have put you through that boot camp experience. Absolutely. I think about the paralytic by the pool at Bethesda in John chapter 5. Jesus has so much respect for Danny Hernandez and, and all of us. He goes up to this man who he knows has been on the ground 38 years, and he asks him a question. 
do you want to get well? And I think to myself for years, and I realized the Lord showed me while I was thinking and praying over that. He respects you so much that he even asks a man who's on the ground for 38 years, do you want to get well or are you, are you satisfied with your functional dysfunctionality? Functional dysfunctionality. That's cool. You're coping. That's right. Danny, are you just coping? Are we just coping? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or do we want to get well? Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that I've said over and over again as we've gone through Philippians is that, is that you know, we need to move away from that and realize that joy in our lives is not a result of our circumstances, okay, but it's a byproduct of our attitude. Mm. And, and if, we, if we live our lives understanding that concept itself, you know, that it is our attitude that's going to dictate our joy, not our circumstances. And we're not talking about a self-improvement program here, are we? No, not at all. There's a statement uh, by one of my favorite authors that really underscores what you're saying, uh, Ellen G. White in Prophets and Kings. She says, could Christians realize how many times the Lord has ordered their way, that the purposes of the enemy concerning them might not be accomplished, they would not stumble along complainingly. <laughs> their faith would be stayed on God, their attitude, mm -hmm. and no trial would have the power to move them. Right. They would not stumble along complainingly, complainingly if they knew how much God ordered your path that day. And I love that word, complainingly, because there's way too many people that live their lives complainingly. <laughs> Can you say that fast, Danny? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I would attempt, but it would sound like that other word. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You've heard that one before, haven't you? <laughs> That's a good one. I, I need yeah. to learn that language. Yeah. Is that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And again, the problem is that a lot of times people complain just to make somebody else miserable. Okay. <laughs> you said something. We got enough junk on our own. <laughs> Look, what did you mean by that, dude? Well, I have enough trials and, and, and junk in my life already as it is. I don't need your junk. <laughs> Mix it with my junk. Because my junk is enough already. Are you going to duck a brother? <laughs> if he keeps getting down on you, bro, <laughs> bringing his cloud around you. Well, you, you know what they say. Pulling you when, down. When you complain about your life, when you're miserable, it, they, they say that 90% of the people don't care and 10% is glad you have those issues. So it's not going to help anybody, you know, this complaining. But it has to be an intentional decision that we make almost on a daily basis to say, you know what, God? I'm going to live a complaint-free day. Go on, brother. And Reach when it you now. do that, well, when you do that, you're going to realize not only how much you complain, yeah. but you're going to start all of a sudden realizing how much everybody else complains. You start getting sensitized. Oh, absolutely. All of a sudden, it becomes so annoying, <laughs> you know, to, to live and be around people who are constantly complaining. We've got a couple minutes left. I want you to share one more illustration. Somebody was listening to your sermon on this topic, a business traveler, and what happened to him when he was traveling that time? He, 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 I ran into him the other day. said, I, I watched your message online, and I was going to Texas, and, and I... I I thought to myself, you know what? I'm, I'm going to try this out. I'm going to be complaint free. So he gets on a, on the airplane and he sees a family that's coming with a bunch of kids. And he thought, no, 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 no. Sit somewhere else. And wouldn't you know, they sat right behind him. A six-year-old girl right behind him. As soon as the flight started, this girl was just kicking and kicking and punching the seat. His head was just shaking the whole time, and it wasn't from tur turbulence, okay? It and was he wasn't just, watching a Rocky no, movie it was, or anything. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it was six-year-old turbulence right yeah, behind him. Right. And he said, immediately, I wanted to complain, but the thought popped into my head saying, you know what? I'm not complaining. And I thought, you know what? My father-in-law paid thousands of dollars for a massage chair. I get one for free. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. And he says that, that that change of attitude helped him tremendously to take a situation that could have been annoying, a situation that would have given, me, given him um, an excuse, basically, to complain, to turn it into something positive and have a, you know, a wonderful trip. That's awesome, Danny. You know, I was thinking before uh, this program... What is it about these um, these marathon medals that I got for finishing a race? 
And, um, you know, the thought occurred to me, there's a reason I keep some of these medals on my wall. They remind me of the commitment that I made and the discipline required in my training and diet and the excitement of crossing the finish line. And I think to myself, I wonder, what if, what if someone just handed them to me? You know, would, would, would these medals mean anything to me at all? And, and then I realized, um, heaven. How would heaven feel if God just handed glory to me? You know, I, I, I think God knows that we need a struggle. That's right. We need to grow up. That's right. Heaven can mean something. When you make those intentional choices, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's just it's it's simple as that. As knowing that that when things come my way, uh, perhaps it's not God testing me, but perhaps God showing me that I can do it. You know that I have the power through Him to to live a joyful life, live a complaint free life, and know that uh, that because of that, my life is going to be better. It's just that simple. Thanks for joining us today, Danny. Appreciate it. God bless you all, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Hope on Fire is produced by Livestreams Media, a listener-supported ministry. To download a free copy of today's program or be a part of our social network, please visit our website at hopeonfire.org. You may also contact us by writing to Livestreams Media, P.O. Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida, 32860, or online at hopeonfire.org. Thank you so much for your letters and continued support. Until next time, may God set your hope on fire.